So bless you, Craig. Take your freedom. I will do that. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for allowing me to be here. Okay, so what I uh, so we're gonna do a little bit of a um, introduction here for everybody to introduce themselves. So now everybody has to do this to make this work. So I want you to turn to the person next to you, and then you say, "God wants to let you know that you're awesome, but I'm his favorite." <laughs> say that to the person next to you. <laughs> <laughs> so it's true, right? That's true. Yeah, you're awesome, but <laughs> I'm his favorite. Yeah. <laughs> because God loves us all. He's favorite. He loves every one of us. I'm going to just uh, say a scripture. Well, actually, let me just say real quick here. In the back, I have some books that I wanted to share really quickly here. Put this down from my podium. And then um, I want to give you... So in the back, there's information about the books that I have there, if you like. And uh, I just want to share, uh, many years ago, I had a lot of people come to me, and they... Um, men especially but women also where they just for some reason couldn't feel uh, didn't know how to express their feelings uh, there was not a good relationship in the expression of their feelings to the people that was with them so I had a lot of techniques to help people learn how to feel and express themselves so uh, they said just why don't you just write a book about it so anyway this is when feelings don't come easy right right tile so and the Lord, when the Lord gives you something to do and you begin to do it, he has a sense of humor because he just wants you to do more. So, so he started sending me the women that are married to the people that are unemotional. <laughs> so then I wrote this book, When Your Mate's Emotionally Unavailable. So most women, it could be men also, but I'll just use women, uh, when they believe that they need to connect with the man that's not expressing their feelings, they want to change that person to make things better. We always want to change our boss or change the person around us to make things better. But the, the key is really you need to change yourself first. So what I need to teach you is that you're an atmosphere changer and you need to believe in who you are and what you have so that when you go into a room, you, you're you a changer of the room. You're the, you're the changer of the atmosphere. You change it because of who you are. But if you try to change the other person, they're not gonna change because they have freedom of will. So, but when you change, you're changing the atmosphere and they have to change to the atmosphere. Especially for your spouses. Typically, men are more insecure than women. The women show up more than men. So what happens is, the man wants to marry the woman, so they pursue the woman to get something that they don't have. Woman wants to receive it and take it because of something that they don't have. So the problem is when the men get married, the women stay the same, but the men change because they go on to pursue something else. And so the women then get feeling that they've been betrayed and then they want to then go pursue the man to give them back what they feel they already got. Don't ask me to repeat this, it's pretty <laughs> interesting. But, but I do this every day in my office. So what happens is I say to the woman, no, let's change who you are and just so you have the confidence of who you are and what you are. And so you're gonna change the atmosphere so that when you walk into the room, you are you you are something and because they're looking to you. So when you go back to what you were before you were married, that's what they're gonna want because they're gonna pursue that. Because if you do all the work, and if you make it work, then they don't have to. See, before when you pursued them, you weren't as involved as before. You weren't doing everything. They had to pursue you to get you to marry them. And as soon as you, they got you, that was the game changer. I got help. <laughs> anyway, I could go on and on. This is, that's, that's marriage. Well, that's another seminar. But anyway. So then I, uh, God gave me another one, Declaring Your Worth. This is 16 chapters of like three pages. It's a, really a devotional to help people with uh, issues of, of worthiness, uh, di uh, forgiveness, and uh, victory, feeling free, significant. Uh, approved of, accepted, loved, worthy, just goes on and on. 
it's it's uh, the chapter talks about why people don't feel that way, and then it's a miracle story about how God changed them immediately to change that way. And then what I did is that there's a page of all the I did a lot of research to find the uh, scripture verses for each one, like finding being accepted or worthy. So what are the scriptures that says you're worthy? So what you do is you read that page over you to declare your worthiness. Because Jesus says a lot about being loved, being victorious, being free, and then uh, so he so this is uh, talks about that. It's really good. That and then the, this one, um, this one was birthed in Bath, England. When I sat, I was sitting next to Randy Clark, and we were talking, and uh, we said, "Hey," I said, "We said we love to see people heal, but the, we're, at the end of the conference, we're the most we're the ones we think about the most are the ones that are not." So, so I said, um, but the difference is that in my office, I see them again next week. So I can change, I can see what's going on why. So I know I have a greater understanding of why they don't get healed. Even the Center for Disease Control, they say that 85% of physical illness have a psychological root. That's huge. I see it about 95% because that's what I work with. So he said, let's write a book about it. So I said, yeah. So, the, so this one is finding victory when healing doesn't happen. It's a lot about why we don't get healed when we pray or why we lose it. And this one just came out in uh, last year. This is a sequel to this, to the one with Randy. Randy wrote the forward on this, Breaking Emotional Barriers to Healing. I'm gonna talk about this one tonight. Uh, this is an amazing book. In the back of this book, as well as one with Randy, and there's an expansion of this. There's 400 medical diagnoses and then the medical reason why, I'm sorry, the emotional reason why that doesn't get healed. Because the church prays through the Spirit to bring healing. Uh, so because the core, when we accept Jesus, we accept Jesus in our core. And what we do is when we pray, we pray through the soul to get to the body, to bring healing to the body. This, the soul is made up of the mind, will, and emotions. So if you have stuff still in your soul, it's going to block you from being able to bring healing to the body. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk about that tonight. So I'm going to put these one of those. Okay, so, and uh, also if you want to sign up for any future conferences that I may have, I'll be doing this again next, uh, actually, Labor Day Eve. So it'll be Sunday on the 1st. Uh, so if you want, put your name and your email, and I can just send you when I'll be in different areas for you to see, to watch God work. So I'm going to, um, let me pray right now in the scriptures. Let me just pray over us, and then I want to start beginning to, 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 I want you to, I don't want you to be the same when you leave here. I want you to be informed, and I want to be healing, and we're going to do a couple of things. We're going to activate you, and at the end I'm going to pray for, uh, as a group, and then we're going to do some individual individual healing. So let me pray. This is uh, Ephesians 1, 17, 18, 19. I pray in the name of Jesus that our Lord God, Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart you are enlightened. You may know what is the hope to which he has called you, and what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who are believers according to the works of his great power in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. All right, so I have a couple of things. Um, I'd like to just look around the uh, around the audience and I want the Lord to just give highlighting some people to me. So some people will highlight it. Let's see. Usually I have to go by what they're wearing and if they change seats, I'm in trouble. So. <laughs> okay, so um, there's a woman that had pink on. Okay, so, so you, yes. Okay, he... Uh, the word came to me a burden uh, and maybe a heaviness that that maybe you're facing. The Lord wants you to know that He wants you to, as you release that, He wants to come and replace whatever is there that may be going on with you. He sees that and He loves you and He, want, he doesn't want you to walk with that. Okay. Um, see, one woman, uh, the furthest back in the back row, you, that you just looked over there, yes, with the. Uh, black dress on the uh, Lord wanted me to let you know 
that you that if you have questions, uh, he wants you, and you were still wondering about some issues with him in your life. He is waiting to answer those questions, and he wants to give those to you as you seek him, and he will give them to you. And then the woman next to you, uh, young lady next to you, he gave to me that. Um, by the way, we all have the ability to to go further. And whenever I give a testimony or I give a, a prophecy or so on, I want you to take it for yourself. Last time, is there a gentleman here where um, I was praying for a man up here? The last time I was here was I don't even know when that was. Yeah, so as I was praying for a man on his back, and I'm going to explain how you can do this. And I was just praying for this person, a man that was sitting back there, he said that he did the same thing in his self, in his mind, as he was thinking about it. God, Jesus doing it to him, and his back was healed instantly just by watching. Is that person here? There's another man. Okay, but anyway, that was awesome. That, that, that happens often uh, in this. In, okay, so... Uh, so, for a young woman back there, now I want everybody to take this. So, he told me that he wants, he has, uh, he's inviting you to access to go to heaven. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, why? By accessing through uh, ascending and descending like the angels do. And he wants you to seek that because he sees you doing that. Um, if you want more, and uh, Katie Souza is a, is a woman that you want to pursue her. She's a, uh, does that a lot. Justin Abraham sees angels a lot. And uh, Ian Clayton is a gentleman that just goes to heaven. And he actually, if you can go on looking out for him, he actually lies down and asks the Lord to take him somewhere. He goes in the spirit and does mission trips while he's sleeping. Because you can actually, uh, there's actually stories of Justin Abraham. He lives in Florida. He was in Florida at the time, and he uh, saw on, on uh, the kid's computer uh, some good friends of his in California. There was a conference. He said, oh, I just love them. I just wish I could be there. And he was just praying for them and so on. And then uh, he was went to do his work, and he got this phone call from, the, from somebody out in California. And they said, Justin, Justin, where did you go? We just saw you here. Why weren't you, why'd you leave? Why didn't you say hello to us? He said, what? I wasn't even there. Yeah, you were on stage with us. We just saw you. <laughs> so what happens is uh, he transferred, and this happens to him, he transferred in the spirit to that place in in the spirit realm, and you, you see you're there, and you're real. And in us, it looks real life, but that's how the Lord does that. That's how Jesus, by the way, went from one place to another after he came back. Okay, so anyway, so pursue the Lord, and the Lord's going to bring more to you. All right? Okay, you do that? And I can bring those names up again if you want. Okay, so the gentleman uh, gentleman back there with the gray gray shirt on in the back seat. You? Yep, you, yes. Uh, the Lord says, um, God sees you have desire. See, there's a desire that you have for something deeper, and he wants to give you that desire. It's like it's there, and he just wants to give you that more. And as you step into it, and like uh, like coming to places to hear, he just automatically wants to give it to you as you just as you just um, allow yourself to receive it. All right. Uh, there's uh, let's see, and also um, uh, see, I saw the same thing about, about going to heaven to the woman in the back also. You, yes, you, that the Lord is going to give you that ability just to go to heaven. And just, by the way, ask for it, even at nighttime. Ask for it while you're, before you go to bed, Lord, give me more and send me where you want me to go. Uh, this gentleman, uh, was it Justin? No, it was Ian Clayton. And you can look in, uh, you can just see his transporting. That's what it is. Just look up transporting with Ian Clayton. So he, um, goes on these mission trips and then he wakes up. So one time he was on the floor uh, in, in his bedroom when he woke up because he was running. They're not always safe, but you, you come back, you know, it's like, you, she, so he's running away from these terrorists, helping this woman and his daughter over this brick wall. So he helped this, this is a true story, his um, daughter and over a brick wall. And when he, when, he, when he got over the wall, he scraped himself and hurt himself. And then he fell on the, on the ground on the other side. And that's when he fell out of his bed and he woke up and he had a scrape on his, on his chest. 
amazing stuff. The Lord is uh, Lord wants to do more of that. Okay, so um, let's see. Um, boy, boy, so red. So okay, so um, who are we looking for? Um, oh, and. Um, So also the one with the stripe, right here, you. Yes, you. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, the, the Lord wants to move you uh, in a, in, he's gonna, wants to move you in a direction that um, you're wanting to go, but you're not exactly sure what the direction is, and the Lord wants to move you in a greater way, and there's a hope in you for more, and you're, going, you're kind of waiting for it, but you don't know what that is. So the Lord's going to reveal that to you as you just seek Him and talk to more people uh, that know the Lord. The Lord's going to reveal that. And as you come to places like this, the Lord just reveals it. And just ask the Lord, what do you want me to have? Um, i tell you, uh, I never used to like shopping, grocery shopping. And uh, my, my wife doesn't like to go to hardware stores, so go figure. <laughs> so, uh, but I love going to them now because I just go there and say, Lord, what do you want? Who are you going to highlight for me today? All right. Walmart, by the way, is the best place to go because they just have a variety of types of people there, and it's a big place, and there's a lot of places you can go. And what the great place to do is when you go and you see a person that has. Um, a cast on their arm or a cast on the leg or crutches, obviously it makes me real prophetic at that time. It says, wow, there must be something wrong right there. So, <laughs> so everybody loves to talk about themselves. So you just go up to them and ask them about it. And then just say, hey, can I pray for you? And then God's done some amazing things and people totally start getting healed. That's really awesome. All right, let me go on. I can, okay, let me just go on. All right, so um, what is amazing is that uh, how come that we can have miracles happen, such as uh, even a seed in a woman in nine months can become a human being? That is amazing, right? It's an amazing miracle. How can then we have the planets that in the vast universe that were uh, just created just by the word, by a word from God? That is amazing. How could we have sin wiped away just by a simple prayer and that we are able to go to heaven? That is amazing. But what, which is interesting to me then, why do we struggle believing in healing or begin to lose it? Because basically, if we can have faith to accept Jesus Christ and then go to heaven, it's the same faith to have to be healed. But then why aren't we, right? So that's what we need to get answered. See, Jesus died on the cross, uh, which is John 3, 16. He died for our salvation. But you know, which is not talked about as much, is that in, in Matthew 8, 17, that he also died for our infirmities and our diseases. So in Peter, of course, 2, 24, his stripes, because of the stripes, we are healed. And we need to believe that that's the case. So why can't I believe the impossible is possible for me? That's what I want to help you learn. Why can't I, whatever is impossible, that's really about faith. See, if I could do it, then it's not about faith. Faith is something that I, could, that, uh, I can't do. I have to have the faith to believe something that I couldn't do. And so that's why we want to believe in the Lord. So, it's, so here's what I want to talk about today. Now, I'm going to stretch your mind, and I, I, and I love making a shift. I want to make a shift in how you think about the Lord. So when you accept Jesus and you go to the cross, from that point on, it's not about believing in or to something. It's about believing from something. All right? So now don't raise your hand, but how many of you believed in a person or a job or a church leader or a church or just someone that promised you something? Okay, we would believe in somebody, all right? You might have believed in this, but... See, when we believe in or to something, if that something doesn't happen, or we're wronged, or it doesn't follow through, we get disappointed. And uh, it, we get disappointed, discouraged, disillusioned, disorientated, I learned a new word, discombobulated. Right? See, as a Christian, we go to the cross for salvation because Jesus died for us, right? So when he died, we died because, as he said, in uh, John 19.30 says, it is finished and the work on earth is done, the punishment and also the forgiveness is complete. 
So in 2 Corinthians 3.16, it says that we have His Spirit. We have everything. When He died, we, and we accept Him in our heart. I don't know if you realize this, but we receive everything He has. All His power and all of His authority. So what's interesting is that, so originally when we, when we are now a Christian because we accept Jesus on the cross, we went to the cross, but now it's looking like we have to recognize that when we, we so when we go to the cross and receive what he has for us, see my little cross here? So when I go to the cross and I receive what Jesus has for me, now from now on, I'm going from the cross to do what he said because of what he gave me. But here's the point. You know, churches do this. Um, this is what we're, we're believed or taught. I'm, all, I'm always having to go back to the cross to get something, to get more power or to get authority or to get more belief. So every time we go back to the cross, that's a sign that I don't believe what I've been already given and I'm having Jesus to die all over again for me. Does that make sense? Okay, it's a bigger issue when we talk about that. That's the issue. So healing and authority is about believing from something that was already given. It's about power and authority that he died for because if you have to go back to the cross, then you do not believe what you have. Understand that so far? Okay, so we need to find out, and this is the bigger issue basically of what I work out of. I work out of that people will come to see me, and I see, uh, see, I see about 35 people a week, and about uh, three to five of them are from someplace in, in the world. Uh, they'll just call me and we'll just uh, have to minister over the phone. So a lot of that happens. And I'm constantly going to help people understand the difference between what they have and what God's given them. So we've been given the authority. So when we become a Christian, we need to take what is rightfully ours. Because it's already been given to us. So we have to, we have to understand what is ours. So when we pray, it's very interesting. When we pray, most people will hope to receive something. So if... if Jesus Christ has all this authority. And what happens is when I go to Jesus Christ for it, and then I, I'm looking to him to get something, but if I don't receive it, it's because I don't know how to receive. And the reason why I don't know how to receive is because my first authority figure didn't give it to me. And listen, so we'll talk a little bit this about later, and I'm going a little off track, but you need to get this, and God wants me to say this. The reason why I have so much trouble connecting with God as an adult is because we didn't connect with our God as a child. When you are born, you do not know who God is. So, God puts a representative into your life as your earthly father to teach you what is about God. So, for, so Proverbs 22.6 says, the parent's job is to train up a child in the way they should go, and when they're older, they won't depart from it. So when we're born, we're assigned parents to be the representation of who God is. So how we're loved, how we're given, how we're given love, how we receive love, or talk about how to talk, how to talk about even God. But the problem is that first God, they can only give you what they have, which is not typically very much. All right, in the grand scheme of things. So what happens is this. 1 John 4.19 is one of my favorite verses, but I don't understand it at all. I love it. Okay, but listen. 1 John 4.19 says, I love because God first loved me. Great passage. It's terrific. Great sermon material. But nobody can really connect to it because I love because God first loved me. So think about it. You can't... My first God is my Father on earth. So if my Father on earth didn't show me how to love and did not give me love, I can't connect to the second Father in heaven who I don't see. That's why it's hard to, to connect sometimes to God in heaven because it's something I don't see when I didn't get connected to my first God who I did see. It's a huge connection. You understand that? 
So what I want to do is I want to help people is why didn't we connect? Well, it's because, and I can't blame my dad. My dad just learned what he learned from his father. But I got to understand that I've got to do something different or I'm not going to connect with my God later on. So I need to learn about love through my heavenly father and I need to work through my stuff with my earthly father first. I get a lot of that. Uh, let me give you a story. There's a, there's a woman that complained of chronic lower back pain from falling down stairs 10 years ago and gets out of bed in the morning with pain level eight. Whenever I, I typically ask people, how much pain do you have, zero to 10? So I can get an idea. When I pray for them, I, they say, I have pain in my back. I say, how much pain do you have, zero to 10? I, I ask them a scale because when you pray for them and they said, how's it going compared to what? So if you have a pain scale, you have an idea of like where, where it went down. Uh, so she started at eight. So with one leg was shorter than the other, also because she walked with a limp, and she did everything, everything she did was painful, sitting, standing, house chores. She went to physical therapy, medications, and other interventions. Uh, little, little, some pain relief she even had, and surgery was not, was not an option. She just didn't want surgery. So she was scheduled for a specialized chronic pain treatment she did not want to go through. And there was only a small percentage of healing anyway. So after we prayed to release the trauma, from the original fall, what I did is we went back to the original fall, dealt with the emotion. Remember, what I, and I'll, I'm gonna demonstrate this later, but we went to the original fall, found out the emotion that's connected to the physical. Because whenever you have an injury, by the way, whenever you have an injury, you always have an emotional trauma. Whenever you have a physical trauma or emotional trauma, you always, always accompanies an emotional trauma with that. And the emotional trauma that always accompanies then a belief. So um, from an emotional standpoint, if your father yells at you as a child, this is all in the book, by the way, Breaking Emotional Barriers to Healing. So when your father yells at you as a child, it's a very vulnerable time. I, father yells, I become afraid, and then I believe the rest of my life that when people raise their voice, I'm afraid. I put away the memory of my father, and then I live off the the uh, memory of the uh, of the emotion, and then the belief. And then, if you don't get rid of that, Satan makes that ten times worse. Okay. So, it's, so what the church does? Church goes through the the spiritual door to does deliverance, and that's good. I mean, you can get rid of the. But if you don't get rid of the emotion, then it's going to come back seven times worse. So what I do is I go I go through the back door. Let's find out where it originally was. Get rid of the emotion. Get rid of the belief. Automatically leaves, and Satan has to automatically because there's no reason for him to be there because you have all of Christ in you. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'll do it again a little later. So anyway, that's what I did with this woman. I had her see God in there. Get rid of the emotion that was connected to the physical. As soon as we did that, the pain went away and she was healed. Awesome. Awesome. Yes, thank you, Lord. Okay, so let me go, let me go and do a little scripture here, since uh, it's not Sunday, but to make this official. <laughs> so let's go. I'm going to go to Matthew 17, 14 through 21. Okay, this will, I'm going to use the NIV. This is uh, Matthew 17, 14 to 21. So okay, so Matthew 17, 14 to 21. When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt down before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. Okay, verse 17. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. Verse 18. Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of the boy and he was healed at that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, because you have no so little faith. Truly I say to you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you must say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing is impossible for you. Praise God. Now, what's interesting about this verse, I don't want to dissect it too much, but it's as if Jesus is saying to us, 
He's saying the cure of the boy is does not depend on me, but it depends on you, on your belief. And so it's not a theological issue. So what happens is, this is a universal truth. So if you approach anything in the spirit of hopelessness, then it's going to be hopeless. It makes it hopeless. And sadly enough, um, the church universal and just things that you hear, it keeps you a sinner or a worm or a wretch. And I'm neither one of those. Neither one of you are sinners. You're all saints. You happen to sin after you accept Jesus. But the point is that I don't see myself as a sinner. I see myself as a bona fide saint. I, I work really hard at getting people to believe that they're good enough, worthy, and deserving, and that they are not a sinner. Now, we do sin, but the glory of God is we have Jesus who already died for us, so we're going to ask for that. I right? want to have repentance for that. So the point is that the more I think I'm a sinner, the more that I don't believe in myself. It's because you cannot believe in yourself unless somebody of greater value believes in you first. You cannot believe in yourself or believe in something else like healing unless somebody of greater value believed in you first and gave you that belief. In fact, I'll go one step further. You can't love yourself or love somebody else unless somebody of greater value or greater authority gave you that love first. Because you've got to learn it. Now, we have it, but it's typically destroyed out of depends how we're related to. Now, it's typically growing up in a vulnerable time, which we don't know. So if we doubt or question ourselves, it creates doubt. Anything then approached with faith and believing in myself, then it creates the possibility of what I have and what I could do. So really, it's up to us. There was a story of a woman in my, in my office. Uh, this woman was not a Christian uh, that I knew of, and she uh, was talking about her husband had left her, so that was the reason why she was in my office. And uh, after one of the sessions, uh, she went to get up to push herself off the chair. So, oh! And so she had this uh, hurt in her arm. I says, what, what happened? She says, well, I turned, um, I think she fell, and then she hurt herself, and then uh, it hurts when she moves a certain way. Well, well, how much can you move? She says, well, I can't move it more than that. I said, you know, um, I, I love to pray with people and just give them an encouragement prayer. Do you mind if I pray? And Because and, uh, I like to see what God can do. Now, she trusts me by that time, so it was just a suggestion. She could say no, but she didn't. So she said, sure. So I just said, in the name of Jesus, now, you don't have to do this, but just touch your shoulder and say, in the name of Jesus, release the uh, emotional trauma, physical trauma, and cellular memory trauma from that fall in the name of Jesus. And I said, just move it right away. She said, what? Wow, what happened? I said, I said, the God that brought healing to your arm is the same God that wants to bring healing to your marriage. So we got to take the opportunity when we can. Did you know that uh, when we pray for somebody for healing, healing is really more, healing prayer is more for an evangelistic tool than there's anything else. That's the best way to ask somebody about Jesus after you bring healing. Because like, why wouldn't I want to know that person, right? Yeah. So we must decide, you must decide how you think. It establishes what you believe. Proverbs 23, 7 says, as a man thinks, so he is. So as a man and woman thinks, so are we, right? So in verse 18, from what I just read, it said, I told your disciples to cast it out, and they could not do it. And Jesus answered them, said, oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? See, the disciples felt this helplessness about what they could do. The father was disappointed because of what they couldn't do. So the father then became hopeless. So it just drags on. So wherever we are, what are we thinking at the time? That's really what's important. So we've got to recognize this. Sometimes it's often that we get, sometimes we get less than we hope for. That can happen whether it's a church or a family member or a pastor or a job or a boss or whatever it is. Then we get discouraged and we get disappointed in your faith and then we lose our hope in believing what we can have. Our, our destiny is stolen, our hope is stolen, 
And then the problem is if we don't get that, if we didn't already have it, it just makes that worse. So there was a woman that, that I worked with. She attended a healing service and she had a back pain from bulging disc and arthritis, and she also had um, asthma. The healer, this is not, this is another healing service of somebody else. The healer called out healing for asthma at the beginning of the service. Towards the end of the service, he declared healing for the bulging disc, and this, and, and the back pain of this woman disappeared. And when she gave her testimony to the audience about the back pain was gone, but the asthma was still there. The event. See, the woman did not seek more healing later on, was and she did seek it. She was healed. In this case, I often see momentary healing. So at the moment when we're in the faith, uh, I see people healed. That's what Randy Clark and I talked about. That in the moment, it's amazing to see that faith happen and how the Holy Spirit works. But it happens when we leave and we go. Then a week later or days later, when we go back into a stressful environment. That emotion from that's overwhelming and takes on, uh, takes over us, and then we begin to lose something that we thought we had. And God wants to bring healing to those, to those in all those situations. So, disappointment and you know, disappointment and discouragement is normal, but it really can be evidence of something bigger. So, because everyone has issues, so turn to the person next to you and say. You've got issues. <laughs> that was an easy one. Right. All the women I can see, honey, you see, it's official. Craig said you have issues. Now take care of them. I've been telling that for years. <laughs> So it's okay. So what happens is, if you have all the authority and power, then why do we get discouragement? Discouragement is uh, emotional root of the past. So I brought this to explain something. So let's just say, if you're with, if you listen to somebody uh, in healing, or you're talking to somebody you're doing healing, if anybody, everybody can see this or not, but no, actually I'll list it up. Okay, so. If you say these words, or if you hear these words, that's because this is something that was given to you, all right? And when you have these words about, especially anything that's negative, the one that's the fad now is, I'm bad. Nope, you're not bad, this is just an accident, all right? So get over yourself. Okay, so <laughs> that's really what it's all about. Like, I'm bad, really? Like. Who you made you king and then told you to say that about yourself, right? It's typically somebody of greater authority, all right? Now here's the problem. When, when you are told this, or you believe it, what happens is that these are negative words that create negative beliefs. And what happens is if it's there long enough, the negative beliefs turn into negative conditions, thoughts, and actions. And this is really then the result, all right? So what happens is conditions happen. Uh, so you, if, if this, the Center for Disease Control is correct, that when, uh, when we have these thoughts, we can have an original issue, like something happened, like a car accident, and I get hurt. But if I didn't realize, if I didn't deal with, um, the fear that was involved, or I didn't deal with uh, my kicking myself because I didn't do something, or a lot of hurt that I had because of it, what happens is that emotion then literally blocks it from being healed. I work with a lot of people, they come to my office, they have an emotional issue, but they also have, an, with that, they have a physical issue. And so I'll begin to say, do you, which do you want to get rid of first, all right? Now, they don't realize I'm dealing with the physical, but that I can. So if they have a car accident, and I say, let's deal with the emotion that goes with They've had all therapy, and they've had prayer. It's because the emotion that aligned itself with that, that also happened with it, that wasn't dealt with. Let's see if I have a story about that. Okay, so a woman shuffling as she walked with a cane, she had the right knee surgery two years ago, and the knee pain was about an eight. 
for three years before that. The left knee was in pain uh, to seven for a few years, but will not receive surgery because she didn't want to go through all that pain, the same that she did on the other one. So prayers and medical treatment was somewhat helpful, but wasn't didn't take care of the issue. I prayed for healing, but nothing happened, nothing changed. So that was to me confirmation that 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 belief of emotional trauma was there. I asked her if she had been restricted in her life with her parents, and she said she had. Um, I will talk about this a little later, but uh, you need in my book I talk about all areas of your body represent something. So typically, when you have pain in your knees, usually from about the waist down. So I'll just exemplify this for you. So um, when I so what am I doing as I'm walking? What am I doing? What am I, what am I doing as I'm walking? I'm walking forward, right? I'm moving forward. So typically then I listen to what they say. I said, what's it like to have to live that way? So they say restricted, hurt. So I listen to the words. So I'm giving you some tips for when you're praying for somebody. So the words are restricted. I can't go forward. I can't do this. Uh, this is something that no limited activity. Okay, and then where is the pain? The pain is in my knee or my feet or my hip area. And the pain, the, the okay, so first is a restriction, and the second is the hip and knee now. This is a moving forward. So if there's any restrictions in here and they say it, that means there's something in my life that's restricted me from moving forward. So she said, um, I asked her, tell me about in your life. I said, Holy Spirit, take you back where she first felt restricted in her life. And when she went back to uh, a time when her mother and father were very strict uh, and uh, she was never allowed to go anywhere and she wasn't able to do in her mind, able to do things she wanted to do. So it was becoming very restrictive. She, she rebelled a lot and then they clamped down even more. She married then a husband who was abusive, and she didn't. He didn't let her do anything much because we typically marry what we know. And she was afraid of uh, family members take hurting her. Uh, she felt lack limited support, feel stuck, limited opportunities. So when I first saw her standing there with Jesus, and we should, in my book I talk about this, and I'll share a little later. I had her put Jesus standing here, thinking about as a child. Jesus standing here in this bubble, protecting her. And her parents on the outside, I said, what's the feeling like? The feeling is like restricted, sad, I can't do anything. I feel oppressed, depressed, oppressed. So I said, uh, is that girl feel safe to let that out to Jesus in that bubble? She said, yes. Now she's never done this before. It was all about the physical, it was never about the emotional. So when she decided to let that go, she let that go and then it began to let go. She was on eight, went down to four, and then I did the same thing with her husband, which I don't think she was a part of at the time anymore. That went down to like two. We did some more, some other areas in life, and finally she left and was totally healed. Yeah, wow, was right. Thank you, God. So you need to realize that looking to someone to get what you need, and if you don't get it, it results in, in lack of significance, lack of love, again, disappointment. So, what we experience in the influential time of life, which is typically childhood, creates the imprint of what you believe for the rest of your life. How you believe in something is determined by how someone of greater authority believed in you first. Right? So what we need to do is we need to get out of that. We need to get out of whatever somebody else of greater authority in your life believed in you. Unfortunately, what happens is, then we marry into someone of, we believe, a greater authority, looking to them to give what we never got. And then it's usually the same thing. Maybe a little bit better, they give it about 10 years, and then we feel it's the same. And then they come to see me. And then I gotta get out, out of it, the same kind of thing again. See, when your authority, your role model authority was positive, I'm talking about parents, caregivers, grandparents, pastors, um, teachers, I had a teacher in sixth grade, her, okay, so I was in sixth grade, it was, why do you remember the ones that was the worst? It's a, it was Kings Highway in, in Connecticut, I, I won't tell you the town, but 
Her name was Mrs. Epstein. She's probably dead now because she was 80 years old, I think, when I was <laughs> <laughs> like, so, so old. Okay, so, so I remember exactly where I was. I could see the big windows there, the doorway, and so on. So we were a pretty chaotic class. She probably wasn't a good teacher. You know, forgive me, Lord Jesus, forgive me for saying all those things. But anyway, so. So what happened is, when she, in, her, in a bout of frustration, she said, you kids, you're not going to amount to anything when you grow up. And I believed her for years. And so I had to go to counseling, not for that, just that, but many other things. <laughs> My wife made me go. <laughs> okay, I had to admit it somehow. Uh, I feel so relieved. <laughs> Okay, so when our, when our authority figures are positive and loving and encouraging, good job, build you up, the imprint really is that I'm good enough, worthy, and deserving, right? I mean, when you work with somebody, so if you're, so the opposite is true. So if your authority figures are negative and discouraging and there's not negative and critical and so on and there's fear going on, then the imprint is I'm supposed to be afraid and anxious. Look, yeah, I, I, this is a whole other summer uh, and when I do seminars like this uh, for a day long or half day seminars, but I give you an inkling. Do you know that this kind of stuff starts in utero? Like when you're in utero, if your mom is anxious, you're gonna be anxious when you when you get born. Look, okay, so when you have a, when your mom, God bless moms, you know. But the thing is, they're just going through their stuff. I, I mean, half the time they're not doing it on purpose. So when moms are anxious, they're their adrenal gland, which is the fight or flight organ, right? It creates adrenaline. Adrenaline then washes over the baby, and the baby then gets anxious. The baby then produces adrenaline in there, adrenaline themselves. It actually exhausts their adrenal gland. Then you're born with an exhausted adrenal gland, produces anxiety disorders and ADD. That's where ADD comes from, fast thinking. And then I can't think straight or it's PTSD in your home, either one. Okay, so there was a woman that um, 23 years ago, a woman was jet skiing and she hurt her knee and after many prayers uh, of pain, she was in, uh, around six to 10 was where her pain was. Six years earlier, she had, she had um, injured the same knee uh, and um, so it was 23 years ago, she had an accident, she hurt the knee. But then um, later, six years later, she, she uh, injured the same knee, so it just became worse. Knee surgery was still, it was still hurting up to about five to eight, even after surgery. After we released the emotional pain from going back to the original fall, so I had to think about the fall. I had to think about Jesus driving the boat, and you uh, know, it's always kind of funny what you can think of. And then, <laughs> And then her falling in and then obviously releasing the emotional trauma and the fear of when that stuff happens, all right? So we release that. And then uh, what happened is she began to release more and more of that. But then she stopped and she couldn't understand why she couldn't go any further. So she said, I don't deserve any more healing. And I asked her, why was that? She said, it's my thorn and because uh, I've done so much wrong in my life. So first of all, uh, in my book, I talk about the thorn. The, the, actually, the book with Randy, I talk about it, is that the thorn was a spiritual issue, not a physical issue. And uh, there's actually proof to show that. So I had to explain that to her. And once she got through that, she realized that she needed to let go of something that she's been holding on to for her own safety, because that's what she did. She learned to do that, to learn behavior. When she got rid of it, then it all went away. She was totally healed. And so... So there's, uh, so this is all conditions from the heart. So the conditions we are seeing have to release it. So the major reason why we can't release something is because either I wasn't taught to release it, or I can't receive healing because I don't believe in myself, or I don't believe in something that's greater than what I believe I can do, right? So you think about it, if you grew up in a home where I had a boy, I had a girl, good job, you could do anything you put your mind to, and it's all encouragement, what are you gonna think about getting things done and accomplishing things later on? I can do this. And what if it's the opposite? Mm, I can't do this. 
right? So then, then they come to do something. So hopefully they come to see people like me to say, you can do this, but I gotta get out of the original person that was so big in their life that made them believe something that's a lie. But you don't know that until you get older, right? And we can get rid of some of that tonight if you like. What time is it? We're gonna, let's, so I'm gonna move on so we can get some of this done. So interestingly enough, how you believe in what Jesus has for you can never be done unless you, and if you've never learned how to receive it, if nobody in your life role modeled how to receive good things. So earthly experiences can determine eternal perspectives. So you cannot believe in the impossible unless you experience it through someone of greater authority because as a child, everything we do is impossible. And that's what our parents' job is. That's what Proverbs 22, 6 is. Train up a child the way they should go and when they're older they want to birth on it. So what we want to do is, so how does it relate to healing is that unhealthy hurts held inside disconnects us from the spirit. It interrupts our ability to hear and feel and sense God, blocks our believing and your authority, makes God small, and also emotions become arrested. So that when they become arrested, I then, I can't move forward because the emotion will get in the way of allowing the physical because, by the way, we're made of two parts, physical and emotional, all right? So physical and emotional. So if my emotion is bigger because all my life I've had a lot of negative emotion, that emotion is going to always overtake my logic to know better. Even Paul said that in Romans 7, he says, I don't know why I do the things that I hate that I do. Because it's all about the emotion. Why do we sin? It's because something makes us stupid, right? And we do things that we don't shouldn't do. Why do we? Uh, why do we sin? Is because of that. Why do we then? Um, why do we not forgive? It's because my emotion gets in the way that I can't because I'm I'm afraid of something, or I don't like this person. I might could go on and on. It all comes back to emotion, and the emotions in the soul, and the soul needs to be dealt with. And it's not. Most sermons are about the deity of Christ, not the humanist. Do you know that Jesus, besides, besides David and Psalms, do you know that Jesus was the most emotional person in the Bible? He has a lot of examples about emotion. But I, I, don't, I don't hear them talked about. Did you know that the, this is my belief. I mean, my father was a pastor, okay? So I grew up in the church. So the church is afraid of emotion. Let's just be honest. Because they say, a lot of churches say, if, I, if you have emotion, then you're not using faith. Well, then Jesus must have been, <laughs> not, not have much, much faith, right? So you need to recognize is that it's all about, you don't want to have too much emotion. Granted, it can get in the way of your faith. I get that. But the point is, you need to recognize, but we were given emotion and we need to do something with it. Otherwise, it gets in the way of our faith. All right? So enough said. Let's just do some cool stuff. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to pray for some people, and it's a demonstration, and then uh, we're going to, I, what I'm going to do is, um, I first, actually, why don't you sit down first, I'm going to do the, I'm going to do the whole group yeah. thing first. So here's what I do, I'm going to do a group prayer, and uh, to help you with something, uh, help you with wherever you're going, and then I'm going to have a couple of people come up for a demonstration, for praying with them, so you can learn how to do it, and then we're going to close a little after nine, and then I'll, I'll be here if people want prayer and we can play some music and stay here till breakfast. Okay. No. <laughs> I don't have to work tomorrow, do you? Okay, so. Okay, so what I want you to do is uh, uh, put your stuff down. We're going to do a little exercise so you have your hands free and your lap free. I don't want any disturbance. We're going to make yourself comfortable. We're going to do a prayer. Uh, we're going to see God do some healing here. 
because he is here. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit's here. So here's what I want to do is I want you to close your eyes. So what I want to do is to help you see and sense the Spirit of God in terms of what he has for you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your healing. Thank you, God, for your healing. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your direction. Thank you, Jesus, for helping us get there. Thank you for your stripes, Lord. Holy Spirit, will you bring to each one of these people here, your, your children, an issue, um, a physical issue, an emotional issue, Something that's been bothering them, that's hurting them, that's overwhelming them, uh, a depression. And those people that are even watching, that you can do the same thing, just sitting in a chair. So I want you to find that on your body. So is it a hurt in your heart? Is it a hurt in your leg? Is it a hurt in your back or even in your head? Whatever it is. Go there. Holy Spirit, will you bring the feeling that they have? It's heavy. It's hurting. It could be oppressive. Sadness. Discouragement. And now, Lord, would you do something? Holy Spirit, will you take them in their mind? Holy Spirit, take them in their mind back in time where they first felt that in their body and in their mind, where they first felt that same kind of discouragement. Maybe you fell, it's where you originally fell and hurt yourself. Or when you originally were discouraged, some of you were just discouraged a lot throughout your life. That was a way of life. Go back to that. Go back to where you were sad because your dad wasn't there, or he left, or he yelled, or you were hurt. And what I want you to do now, I want you to see Jesus there. Each one of you I want, would like you to see Jesus. If Jesus is not safe for you, find somebody else, a grandfather, grandmother, aunt or uncle, even yourself, but find somebody safe that you could be with now take your arms and cross them across your chest. If you need to, you can see what I'm doing. And put your hands on your biceps as if you're getting a hug from Jesus or whoever that safe person is. You're now in this bubble with them. You're being safe and the injury, the hurt, the person that's hurting you is on the outside of that bubble. It's time. It's time that you <coughs> see it differently. I want you to see Jesus or whoever the safe person is and begin to give away to them. Whoever hurt you or whatever hurt you gave you hurt. It gave you sadness. It gave you discouragement. And you took it because it was a vulnerable time. It's time to give. Jesus, I give you freedom back. I, t I give you your control back. It was taken away from you. Your right to feel happy was taken away. Give that away. And now what I want you to do is I want you to begin to give yourself a love tap. Just like you would when you were holding a little boy or girl and your arms are around them on the back and you're tapping them in the back saying, I love you. So tap back and forth like I am, like real left, right, left, right, like this. And what you're doing is you're helping them to feel better by releasing your emotion and your memory and letting them know it's going to be okay, like you would for a little boy or girl. When you're hugging them and you're patting them on the back, letting them know how much you love them. Just let it go. Now one hand at a time. Just one hand on the other. One hand on the other. Just release it. Release it. So I'm going to pray in the name of Jesus. 
I command the physical trauma to go. I command in the name of Jesus emotional trauma to go. I command in the name of Jesus cellular memory trauma to go and trauma memories. And the trauma memories of what you heard, of what you saw, the hurt, the rejection, the sadness, let it go, let it go. If you wanted to let it go, tap faster, because you're letting it go. See yourself like knocking it out of you. See yourself doing something about it because you don't want it anymore. Just let it go. Tap it out. Let it go. Like, and you're doing the same thing when you're just letting him know, I love you, I love you, I love you. Let it go, let it go. Yeah, you don't need it anymore. Release it, release it. Yes, thank you, Jesus. Jesus, give them more. Now, Lord Jesus, on earth as it is in heaven, give each, each one a sense of peace, a sense of love. Peace and love and worthiness and deserving. Shalom. Yes. Shalom. Shalom, Lord. Yes, to Yes, replace the hurt, replace the sadness with love and joy, peace, joy unspeakable. Thank you, Jesus. So how many of you with your eyes closed, how many of you have some sense, some shift, some change, some sense that Jesus is there, that's providing some sense of safety? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. There you go. More, Lord. Yes, give them more. So keep on tapping that. Keep on loving yourself. Loving on yourself. So what you're doing is you're giving yourself a hug. Jesus has given you a hug and a love pat. This is all in the book to help you further so you can love on yourselves. You're getting healing from an emotional sense that you've never been allowed before, either for the first time, just allow yourself to release it. And those that feel like they don't feel anything or seem stuck, that means that emotion is getting in the way greater than your sense of being able to release because it's so great. And Jesus wants you to go back further where it started. Everybody had the ability to have feelings at one time, but then the ability to release it was destroyed at one time in your life. Everybody. <coughs> And so everybody has the ability to have some kind of sense of release. And God wants you to give you that. And I want you to have that. Just release it, release it, release it. How many, yes. How many others have a feeling of release? How many others raise your hand? Yes, release it, release it. Good, thank you, Jesus. All right, you can open your eyes. So let me tell you a couple of things that's going on. <clears throat> First of all, we all need love. God loves you very much. And you all know that. I mean, you know that in word. But very few people feel it. Again, it's so true that I cannot love myself or feel loved unless someone of greater authority first loved me. And then I take that love and I can move. But on, and then I can't give what I don't have. Spouses know that more than anything. A man or woman. All right? It's so much out there. So what I want is, I want, the Lord's given me things that to share with people to be able to download and make it happen. So for example, that's why if you can't get something moved in the spirit, you need to get it moved in the soul. And so to do that, you've got a sense, you have to have a sense of safety. Among the biggest reasons why people can't move out of their hurt or their trauma or their condition is because of, well, when that happened, you felt unsafe. And until you feel safe again, that's why a traditional psychotherapy, I'll just, I, that's what I was taught in. It's allopathic medicine. I don't tend to do that much anymore because allopathic medicine, allopathic, not medicine, but allopathic mental health 
and, uh, which is psychotherapy, tends to be uh, maintenance feel-gooders. So it's maintenance to help you feel good, but you gotta go back again to feel good again. I just wanna be healed. I just want it over with. I don't want you to be in my office for years. That's, okay, so I, wanna, I get it done usually within two sessions, depending on what it is. And if they got something else, then we'll continue that. But my point is that I want people healed because I want to work out of the authority and the power that Jesus gave me. And that's what I want for you. So first of all, I need to create safety, all right? So let me demonstrate. So, um, there's somebody here that has an anxiety. There's an anxiety about... Um, Conflict. They don't like conflicts, and they are. They don't like loud voices, you know, like that sort of thing. Now, when people come up here, I'm going to have them shut off the that uh, the. Um, they're going to be shutting off the Facebook Facebook, Facebook live. live. Okay, <laughs> that's number one. Number two, I don't need to know details. I, I don't need to know details because God, and you know it. I'm just. We're just going to get it healed. We're just gonna go back to a memory that you may have, but we don't need to relive it, because I don't wanna, that's not my issue, that's not what I do. We just get rid of whatever's there.